small beginnings. Amen? Now, I understand and I recognize that we are an established church. I also understand and recognize and realize that we've been through some, some things. <laughs> but the most important thing is Jesus Christ has been with us every step of the way. Amen? Amen? So, we're moving forward. We are a church. We are a body. We are committed to God. God's committed to us. We know who we are, and we know where we're going. And by the leading of the Holy Spirit, that's how we're going to get there. Amen? Amen. So my request to you is follow God and Pastor Mark and myself. Mm -hmm. I want to share with you briefly before I turn it over to Pastor Mark. But the two of us have committed to God, to each other, mm -hmm. and to the oversight, director and pastor, um, who's a pastor that has been pastoring churches for many years. We speak to him regularly. We just spoke to him this week, Thursday, we, or Friday, I'm sorry, we had a Zoom conference. It's always a joy to speak with him. He is a storehouse of information. He's a wonderful person. You've met him. We're looking forward to the time where he can come this way and just minister to us and just be with us. Mm -hmm. I can honestly say that he is um, absolutely thrilled to be a part of this ministry. Pastor Steve Aldridge, who is the pastor of the church in Hudson Valley, is also has taken has come on board as our oversight, along with Pastor Vic Therese. And I will have an opportunity to have you all meet with them at some time. But these are guys that I trust with my life. Mm -hmm. Who aren't afraid to say, Aunt, you missed it. Who aren't afraid to say, Aunt, you made a boo-boo. Who aren't afraid to say, Aunt, keep on plugging. He's nothing, they're nothing but encouragements. Am I right, Mark? Absolutely. They're wonderful people. We have people that are overseeing what we are doing as pastoral leadership and as a group. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to give Mark an opportunity to speak today. And I want to tell you this by the strength of the power of God in his life that he's able to do so today. Yes, and I'm thankful for it. It is no menial task. I told him that he had free reign whatever he's comfortable with. And what I mean by that is, if he's comfortable standing here for 10, 15 minutes, that's fine. Mm -hmm. If he's comfortable here standing for half an hour, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Everything is okay. Because you see, he's here yep. physically. He's going to be here. He's there spiritually. Physically, it's going to line up. And I want to encourage him. And I will tell you, and he will tell you, I'm sure, that I do not do anything other than encourage him. There's been some times when, you know, we'll look at things and we're like, okay, let's get rid of the oh hum attitude and let's pick ourselves up by the bootstraps and let's remember who has called us, what he's called us to, and that he's our ability. And after he shares today, I want to start day one. I realize that we're just a small group at this point. There are a few others that I would like to have been here, but I'm recording it because I want to go over our new statement of faith. Maybe you know it, maybe you don't. We have altered it, and I want to share it with you. That statement of faith is who we are and what we are doing. Proverbs says that without a vision, my people perish. We have a vision. We'll go over it. And then I will share with you the statement of faith and the statement of what this church represents and what we're going to do that incorporates the vision. Amen? Mm -hmm. So there's something to be excited about. We're moving into it. We're transitioning into a new, a new phase in the life of this church. I don't care what's happened in the past. It has no effect on me. Yep. doesn't change who I am. It doesn't change how God sees me. It doesn't change how I feel about my Savior. All I care about, and I'm going to tell you all that Mark cares about, 
is that we lift Jesus Christ up in him crucified and resurrected. And we want everyone to know, you included, that as a part of this ministry, you are welcome. You are a member. There will not be any do's and don'ts that will cause you not to be a member. You're a member because of your commitment to the church. First, your commitment to God and the commitment to his church. Mm-hmm. And we'll get into it. I'm going to get into it a little bit down the road. I'm going to share with you what the scripture talks about, how Pastor Mark and I believe that the fivefold ministry gift, how many of you have heard that phrase, the fivefold ministry gift? Yeah. I'm going to take it apart and I'm going to apply it and use it as an analogy with the hand. I'm going to do that probably next week. The prophet, the pastor, the teacher, the evangelist, all of those fivefold ministry gifts, Scripture says that Jesus is appointed to the church for the edifying of the saints for the work of the ministry. That's you. Mm-hmm. Here to build you up. Here to build you in the church. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not stand against it. Many times we get into all kinds of building concepts and how we're going to get more people and what we're going to do and we're going to do this and we're going to do that. And I'm not saying that we're not supposed to sit here and do anything. But my point is this. Jesus builds the church. Amen? Amen. Jesus is called, Pastor Mark and I, to build people. I'm not here to build a building. I'm not here to make this place make some sort of formulas that's going to make this place grow. That comes from the goodness of God and our experience with the goodness of God and our exposure to those around us and as they watch our lives. That's not to say that we don't have an opportunity to witness. This church is precedented on evangelism. That was one of the key things that Pastor Doug would do on a regular basis. It was built on evangelism, and that is a part. So we're going to get into that. Amen? We're going to look at it, and we're going to see who you are in this church how you are appreciated, how you're loved. You are in a very safe place. You are family. Mm -hmm. You will always remain family. And we, we commit ourselves to be faithful to God and faithful to those who come to this church. Those are his people. You are his people. And we're here to build you up. Amen? Jesus came and he built People. People followed. I'm believing for the miraculous. Every day before Sunday comes, my prayer is simply this. Father, show yourself in such a real way that it just turns us so upside down and gets us so excited, it blows the roof off. There's a lot of people in this village that are watching. And I want to see him. I want them to see Jesus Christ glorified. Not me, not Pastor Mark, but Jesus Christ glorified, working in the lives of everyday people faced with everyday situations and circumstances. Amen? Amen. We are special because of who we believe in. Mm -hmm. Amen? We are righteous because of what Jesus has done. Mm -hmm. Amen? So now I introduce to you Pastor Mark. I know. <laughs> he looks very dapper today. He's got a nice yeah. jacket on. Pastor Mark, we turn it over to you. introduction, Ethan, Pastor Ethan. You mentioned the evangelism that uh, Pastor Doug was very well known for. And before he left the area and moved to Florida, we often used to meet on the 840 trail and we would walk sometimes five, six, seven miles 
And oftentimes, very oftentimes, we would discuss scripture. And he said to me, you really seem to enjoy this, don't you, Mark? Because he used to see me taking notes. He used to enjoy the conversations that we used to have. And I said, yes, I do. I said, as a matter of fact, I wish that I could be up there sharing scripture with people the way you do. I never really thought it was going to happen. But then along came Pastor Billy, and of course he ordained Pastor Anthony and myself as teaching pastors. And although I've given some messages in the past, it's been a couple of months through some health issues. And, you know, thank God that um, I'm working my way through it. And, you know, I, I appreciate everyone's well wishes and their thoughts and their prayers. I, I really do. I know there's a couple of birthday celebrations. I believe Stacy has a birthday. We wish you a happy birthday. And Jonathan's wife, I think, Amber, has a birthday. So please tell her that we wish her a happy birthday as well, Lola. Well, anyways, going along with Pastor Anthony's timely message, which was given last week, which of course was Easter Sunday, and you know, when I look at these, these nice signs over here where it says, Lord of Lords, King of Kings, you know, that, that just brings to mind exactly who Jesus is. And I would like to carry on with another aspect of our risen Lord of Lords and our Savior. Uh, last week, Pastor Anthony did mention that my favorite book in the Bible is Hebrews. Hebrews. <laughs> <laughs> and so with those two thoughts in mind, I'd like to share with you this morning these following thoughts, and quite a few of them are coming from, of course, the book of Hebrews. And I may have mentioned it before, but one of the reasons why I enjoy that book of Hebrews so much is when I begin to explore the scriptures on my own, and oftentimes that was very late at night and early in the morning, and I started reading the book of Hebrews. It was like what happened to the Apostle Paul when on that road to Damascus. And then, of course, when later on, it talks about how the scales fell off of Paul's eyes and he was able to see again. When I started to read that book of Hebrews on my own, and I realized what it was like or what it was about, in so many places about the new covenant and it really brought an appreciation to me about this new <clears throat> covenant and I wanted to learn as much as I could about it and about of course what Jesus has accomplished for us and undoubtedly as I said we often think of Jesus as our Lord and Savior I know that I do many times refer to him as just that, as our Lord, and as our Savior. Certainly, without a doubt, it's the right thing to do, isn't it? It's a good thing, in fact, that we should refer to him as that, because he really is that. He is our Lord. He is our Savior. As a matter of fact, going back to the great prophet Isaiah, who centuries before Jesus was born, he wrote a verse that, you know, I think we often think of at Christmas time, because I've seen it in many Christmas cards. We read how Isaiah prophetically refers to Jesus in this manner. For a child will be born to us. That's from Isaiah 9-6, by the way. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called 
wonderful counselor, mighty God, eternal Father, and Prince of Peace. However, Scripture also teaches us something else about Jesus. It attaches to him a title that I think, for whatever reason, is often overlooked. And it's this, that Jesus is our High Priest. And again, I think that our tendency, my own included, is to focus on or think about Jesus' life when he was here on earth, beginning with his miraculous birth in the manger, about his baptism with John the Baptist, about that wonderful three and a half year ministry that he took part in, and about all the many, many miracles that he performed. And of course, at Calvary, and his finished work on the cross, and his resurrection. And in doing so, when thinking about all these things, it often could overshadow the magnificence and the importance of this role that Jesus now performs, this very important part of Jesus that you know, I, I really think a lot of people give little recognition or thought about. So with that being said, let's consider together my favorite book of Hebrews, chapter 7, verse 11. And we see that the writer, who I believe is Paul, starts out with a question. So in Hebrews 7, 11, it says, Now if the perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of it, the people received the law, what further need was there for another priest to arise or to be designated according to the order of Melchizedek and not be designated according to the order of Aaron. So here is Paul writing to the Hebrews and right here in this 11th verse he's got a question. And after reading this, giving it some consideration, I would have to say to Paul, you know what? I think that's a good question. And the first thing that I would like to point out from this verse is the word perfection. I say this because it brings up to me at least still another question that makes me wonder, why is perfection the goal of the priesthood? If the Levitical priesthood was in fact perfect, then why have another priesthood come into play? After all, you can't add to perfection. If something is perfect, well, it's perfect. There's nothing else to add to it to make it more perfect. There's no flaws or defects. So why don't we continue this morning and find out the answer to that very important question. When I encounter the word perfection in the Bible, I often think of what Jesus had to say about it in Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, where Jesus said, So then, be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Well, were the Levite Christ, Christ um, were the Levite priests perfect? They who were in charge of fulfilling the duties and obligations of this Levitical priesthood, which they were in charge of? No. The Levitical priesthood and the Levite Christ, Christ in it, weren't perfect at all. What we do see in Scripture, however, is that even they, the Levite priests, had to have animal sacrifices for their very own sins. So no, they weren't perfect at all. We have an earlier prophecy that's recorded for us from the book of Psalms, chapter 110, verse 4, that kind of touches on this, and it reads, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. And he says, you 
are an eternal priest, after the pattern or in the order of Melchizedek. So Paul's intention when he wrote this letter to the Hebrews was to show that since God promised in this verse from the Psalms that the coming Messiah would in fact be a priest after Melchizedek's order, and if so, it meant that the Levitical priesthood that was in place at that time would eventually come to an end. Why? Because it was inadequate. It was not perfect. Because if it had been adequate, if it had been perfect, then Jesus, the Messiah, would have functioned as a Levitical priest. He would have come from the tribe of Levi, not from Judah. But instead it would be in the order of Melchizedek. And not only that, but he would be a perfect priest, one without sin. This high standard of perfection that exists because of, of God. He wanted the perfect priesthood because God himself is perfect. Now, according to the Greek-English lexicon, I looked it up, this word perfection. The Greek translation, as used here, is pronounced teleosis, and it means the following, a fulfillment of, an accomplishment of, the event which verifies a promise. So what was that fulfillment for a future event? Well, again, another verse that I think we think of often at Christmas time is this one. When Elizabeth, who is the cousin of Mary, Jesus' mother here on earth, Elizabeth speaks these words to Mary. And it's taken from Luke chapter 1, verse 45, and I'll read it for you here. It says, And blessed is she who believed that there would be Notice this next words, a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. And of course, that fulfillment, that promise that came to be that is spoken of here was the coming birth of Jesus. It had happened and it did occur. I point this out because it is the same root word that is used in John Chapter 19, verse 30, when Jesus said, it is finished. It was a completion. It was a fulfillment. In other words, he accomplished. Jesus accomplished what he had set out to do. He fulfilled his mission. It was completed perfectly. Jesus was born of a virgin birth. He died on a cross at Calvary and was resurrected and ascended to heaven, just as it had been prophesied, teleosis, perfect fulfillment of a promise. So, God the Father desires more than simply a creator and a creature relationship with us. What God really wants, what he desires, is a willing love relationship as a matter of fact, so closely does he intend or want this with each and every one of us to be in this relationship with him that he describes it beautifully in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17, like this. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one in spirit with him. And Jesus himself used similar words in that beautiful prayer that he prayed just before his death in the 17th chapter of John verses 22 and 23 these are the words of Jesus the glory which you have given me I have given to them that they may be one just as we are one I and them, you and me, that they may be perfected in unity, 
so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you have loved me. And I believe that in doing so, he gives us the shadow of this closeness, even in our lives in a human marriage and also as Christians, as part of the bride of Christ. This type of closeness, this spiritual union, requires that we be made compatible with him. It's plain that we become immersed in him and he in us requires it. But here's the thing, left to our own devices, on our own, we don't qualify. On our own, we cannot make ourselves compatible with God. Pastor Anthony touched on this earlier about our little church here, our congregation. We are a new covenant church. We're a grace-believing church. And grace, as we know, is the basis for the Christian faith. We believe that we are saved by faith through grace. And God's grace, we've talked about it before, is defined in this way as undeserved favor. Grace cannot be earned. It is something that is freely given to us time after time after time. We count on God's grace and the type of this bridge that he lovingly built in our relationship with him. And so for this, we need a great high priest. For this, we need the Lord Jesus Christ. I'd like to read just one more verse from the book of Hebrews this morning before closing. Again, this is a Reader's Digest condensed version. It was going to be longer, but as I had explained a couple of months ago, when I gave a brief synopsis on each of the chapters of Hebrews, that I'd like to share each chapter as a whole in the future. So anyways, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 through 16, it reads like this. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, and of course that's Jesus, the Son of God, goes on to say, let us hold fast our confession. In verse 15 it says, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things, yet without sin. Verse 16 goes on to say, Therefore, let us draw near with confidence. It's great that we could have this confidence now. To the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. And we sometimes sing the song here at Southgate Ministries. We sang it this morning. The victory of the cross. And it is this victory that we can move confidently forward in. Jesus paved the way. He made the way for us. So that all who trust and believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. It is this finishing, this perfection, this completion or fulfillment <laughs> that the priesthood of Jesus is designed to provide. As, again, as that Greek word says it, teleosis. It's complete, it's fulfilled. When Jesus from the cross uttered the words, tetelestai, or it is finished, it is in part this completion to which Jesus is referring. His finished work on the cross is what made our compatibility with God possible and makes him the anchor of our soul, as it says in Hebrews 6.19. So, that's my Reader's Digest.
condensed version of the message that I was going to give. I believe Pastor Anthony has some yes. comments that he wants to make this morning. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Martin. Bear with me just a second here. What I want to do is I want to take up maybe five, ten minutes of your time. I want to establish who we are. Every church has a statement of faith. Amen? This statement of faith is available to every individual. You I will make I will put copies out next week so that those who want to have a copy, you're free to have that. Amen? But the statement of faith, who we are, what is Southgate Ministries? We're under new leadership. We have a vision. We have a purpose. We know who we are. We know where we are. We know where we're going, and we know how we're going to get there. Statement of faith, we believe in God, the Eternal Father, his Son, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. We believe that there is a trinity that work, that work as one. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Point two, we believe that the Bible is the inspired and only infallible and authoritative Word of God. Number three, we believe that humankind was created in the image of God to know and enjoy Him. Yet we willfully rejected the lordship and glory of God for which we were intended. Because of this, sickness, death, and judgment enter the world, and now creation experiences the effects and consequences of sin. We believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, the, only, the one and only Son of God, was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of a Virgin Mary, and is God-anointed one. Empowered by the Holy Spirit to inaugurate God's kingdom on earth, he was crucified for our sins, he died and was buried, resurrected and ascended into heaven, and is now alive today in the presence of God the Father and his people. He is true God and true man. We believe that we are saved by God's grace through faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Anyone can be restored to fellowship with God through believing and receiving Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. The Holy Spirit regenerates, justifies, sanctifies, and adopts us as we enter the kingdom of God as his sons and daughters. We believe in the ongoing sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit by whose indwelling the Christian is enabled to live a life and minister supernaturally. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, according to Acts 1, 4 through 8, and Acts 2, 4, is poured out on all believers that they may have God's power to be his witnesses. We believe in the victorious, redemptive work of Christ on the cross and his resurrection that provides freedom from the power of the enemy. We believe that the church consists of all who put their faith in Jesus Christ. He gave his church the ordinances of baptism and communion. The church, church exists to carry on the ministry of Jesus Christ and further advance his kingdom by living in the finished work of the cross, preaching and living the good news of God's grace and discipling the nations, baptizing and teaching them to live in the grace of God. We believe in the sanctity of marriage between a woman and a man as ordained by God. We believe in the ever-increasing government of God and in the blessed hope which is the glorious, visible return of the Lord Jesus Christ to rule and reign with his overcoming bride, us, the church. We believe that heaven and hell are real places. There will be a resurrection of the lost and the saved, the one to everlasting death and the other to everlasting life. That's our statement of faith. This next statement is actually 
something that Pastor Mark and I, and we went over it with Pastor Don Friday. This is something that we wanted to offer you. This is our commitment to you and your commitment to us as we commit ourselves and our lives in this fellowship to Jesus Christ. There are no requirements here. These are statements of truth. And it starts as this. As a member of Southgate Ministries, worship the one true God with other church members for as long as I am physically able. The goal of my regularly weekly worship is to give God glory. To grow spiritually through regular involvement in groups and classes in addition to regular personal devotional times. I understand the purpose of these groups and classes is building community with other believers and holding each other's other accountable. <clears throat> serve Christ through the mission work. I've asked Pastor Don to send us some missionary groups that he would that he would recommend that we could support. We have laid low for the last year. It's time to step up to the plate. Remember, we agreed we we're going to. This was no. We're going to be a church. We're going to be a church. And part of the church is to give into the mission field, and that's what we're going to do. I am created to serve others through good works. I am commanded by God to make disciples of every nation, tribe, people, and language through the local church. I will support the church. I will support <clears throat> the church mission to share the gospel from the local neighborhood to the ends of the earth. Give to God abundantly and joyfully, recognizing God as the owner of all things. Giving my financial support and time is my response to the blessings of God in my life. I want you to understand that. It's not like it was before. You get a phone call. Where's your portion? We're all adults here. Amen? We all have a love relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. And we come together once again to give God abundantly and joyfully, recognizing God as the owner of all things. Giving my financial support and time is my response to the blessings of God in my life. Once again, I am not preaching to the choir to the people that are sitting in this room. You have all committed to do just that, and we appreciate it. But we want to make a statement that just says, hey, we're here, here committed to Christ, committed to each other. As a member of Southgate Ministries, seek unity with other church members. I recognize God's design for the church is unity and diversity. And I will put the interests of others above my personal preferences. I will guard the reputation of the church. Don't be afraid. Well, you know, I hear. You want to know the truth? Let me share with you the truth. Don't be afraid to share the truth. Pastor Anthony isn't this. Pastor Mark isn't that. This is what we believe. Pray for and submit to the leadership. I will pray privately with and with the church corporately. I will pray for people to accept Christ. And I will pray for more disciples to grow in their faith. Share the good news of Jesus with others. I will make my attitude that of Christ. And through humility, make the gospel my priority through selfless good works and evangelism. You know, this isn't, there's not a list of do's and don'ts here. This is all a list of just from the heart. My commitment to you, Jesus. My commitment to the fellowship that I am a part of and our commitment to each Amen. other. Amen? Amen? Something you can count on. And as a member of Southgate Ministries, with Christ as my Lord and Savior, being baptized by immersion after salvation, being led by the Holy Spirit, and being in agreement with doctrine and leadership, I joyful, joyfully unite with the church and commit myself to God and all the other members. This is something that we are going to also incorporate in our new members class that we are currently putting together because we are believing for new people to come and they will need guidance. I'm corporately putting everyone here whose grandfather, as they would say, because you've been a part of this church for as long as I've been here and before. Stacy and your family and Wilma and Harvey and Steve and, and Janet and Mark and Sandy. 
But as new people come and they want to stay, then we give them, we give them the opportunity to share with them what this establishment believes in and stands for. And what they can expect. Amen? Amen? So you can look forward in the future. On one of the things that Pastor and Mark and I have talked about, um, you know, I understand that Stacy's children are a little older. We have Lily. Um, Sarah has informed me that Lily's cousins are a very good chance of coming for the summer. So, you know, I don't have an issue with the children being with us during our time of worship. But what I think I'm going to do, what Pastor Mark and I want to do, to incorporate um, as part of the service, instead of, instead of, we're just not ready, we're going to be relocating. So instead of, you know, establishing... Right now, yes, we have another room. But what we decided to do is we'll take, you know, 10, 15 minutes uh, of the service and just address to the kids. The Word of God at their level. Moms and dads are there so they can oversee what, what's being taught. The children will have it at a level that they can understand. And then we'll continue on. And we'll do that until we get to a point where we can have a regular class for the kids. But I don't want to have them just sit there. You know, once again, for family, we're family. And I realize they're your children and they're your responsibility as parents. But they're our responsibility corporately to, together also. And I want, to, I want to provide a place for them to grow. I realize there's a shorter attention span. Like I said, this isn't going to be something that's going to be over their heads. Five, ten minutes. Simple message. Simple message. What does righteousness mean? What does it mean to be saved? What does it mean? What does faith mean? Simple message to enforce what I'm sure you're teaching your children. And we're taking an active part in their life. I don't want them overlooked. It's been on my heart for a while, and I just haven't, Pastor Mark will tell you, we've had conversations and just haven't come to a, well, how can I do this? How can I do this in that, you know, I don't want to put them in another room like for right now. We've got a room over there. It's got all kinds of, you know, things that keep them, keep them busy, but that's not what I want. I want to teach them. I want them educated. If I knew at their age what I know now, how much more, how much better would I be? in my walk with Christ, in my dependence on Him. I want our children to understand that they can depend on God for everything, just as they can depend on their parents. To me, parents are Jesus with skin on. There's not one thing that a parent, there's not one thing that Stacy or Justin would not do for their kids. There isn't one thing. And the other thing is, is that when they correct their children, it's not rejection. We in the church have been brought up in this mentality that, you know, if we're corrected, oh, you don't love me anymore. No, 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 no. No. No, not at all. Jesus looked at, at, at those around him and he said, you know, you fathers being, you earthly fathers, could you not give your children good gifts? How much more your heavenly Father, who loves you? There's not one doubt in Elena's mind that her mother isn't there for her at any given time, in any given situation. Doesn't matter. Now, does mom get upset with some things? Well, yeah. You know, we're growing, but mom always loves me. Dad always loves me. And I can run to them. And I want them to understand that, yes, that's great. They have Christ, too, that they can run to when mom and dad aren't around. And it's truth. It's a reality. So that's been on my heart. And that's what I kind of I came up with. I, I threw it out there to Pastor Mark last week. And his response was quick. 
That's a great idea. I think it's great. He said, well, I just want the adults to understand that we're going to take 10, 15 minutes of our time and spend with the kids. And, you know, we're going to look at it from the other side. When we're here as adults, they're sitting there. So we're going to give 10, 15 minutes of our time so that we can just encourage our children. Amen? I got to tell you, most blessed the living daylights out of me last week. My heart just melted when he came up here. I mean, he just, I, he, the young man got up and walked over and was taking a picture of the TV. And I'm like, you really want that? I got it. I give it to you right here, right now. And he was just as open as could be. Like, and I sat there and I said to myself, God, now is the time. It's the time. Oh, the work is just, he's just open. No limitations. I said, you know, you know, we got some pictures up on the wall that, you know, depicted that, you know, bring the children to me. Yep. And yet that's a depiction that we need to have a childlike mentality that says, nothing holds back, I'm not afraid, I'm not scared, God loves me, I can rest in his presence. You didn't see fear in that young man's eyes last week. You didn't see one iota of negative concern. He was sincere. And I haven't grown to know the boy that well, but I know him. That showed me a facet of him last week. I said to myself, if we all could be like that. He sincerely is very concerned for Patrick. And I would encourage that young man to, you know, as often as you can throw hoops with him, throw hoops with him. And if you can interject some of your life experiences, what God's done for you in your life, that's great. And if you can help and support him, and God's here, he's not going to forget, forget you, Patrick. That's great. I want to support that. That really just, I went home and weeped. I was just like, my goodness. I told Don when was, we were talking Friday, Saturday, Friday, I said, Don, you're not going to believe this. This young man just got up, walked over to the TV, he's got his camera out on his phone, click, click, and I looked at him. You really want that? He came over, he absolutely stood right next to me, he gave me his phone number, I texted him to him. And as I'm planning on texting more stuff to him. Of course, anything that I text him, I'll text the mom too. I'm not here to take over his parenting. Mm -hmm. I'm here to support. There you go. That's their job. But I'm more than willing to help support. Mm -hmm. I wish there were more people that helped in my times of needs and times of crisis. That's what we're here for. Amen? So that's what we're all about. <coughs> We're working, we're still waiting to find, get the, the uh, closing date. Um, I did talk to uh, the owner of the bank. He's willing to remove the, the table. But it's such a small room. And Don said something to us on Friday that really uh, hit me. And Don said, well, you know, I'm trying to I'm trying to picture a sixteen by sixteen room. He says, kind of hold you back a little bit from, from growing. And I agree. So it's not off the table, mm -hmm. but I do have. Uh, I'm waiting to hear word from the the uh, new buyer to see if you know he's going to allow us to still use down here for a period of time and how long, so that we can prepare. I can tell you that I did have a conversation with John, who is the owner of the bank, and there is another side, the other side of where the barbershop is. It's probably as large as this that hasn't been finished. So I did say, uh, you know, I want to have Mark and I get together maybe this week and we're going to go and look at the room upstairs. And maybe, you know, he's planning on doing something this summer with it. And if it's large enough and it's something that we can afford, we're going to go over finances next week, where we are, what's going on. 
Um, and maybe that's something that will work. I'm open. Here's the reasoning why, okay? I'm looking at this from a reality perspective. As much as I'm looking at the gentlemen and the ladies in this room, we're all physically able, but you know, who wants to start swinging sheetrock? I'm just being honest. I've been doing it for 40 years, okay? Now, am I glad to do it? Yes, now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. You know, who wants to start building walls? Doing that, you know, so if we can find some place that's affordable and it's move-in ready, that makes sense to me. You know, I've thought about it, you know, you got the old restaurant over here, you got the restaurant next to the Stewart's. What do you got going against two men? Made your renovation. We want to seek that kind of money into something and then, you know, so just I'm going to ask you. You want, I'm going to encourage you to pray for the direction of God for the leadership of this church. The leadership of the church right now is you've got two elders, two pastors, past teaching pastors. You've got Pastor Mark and myself. We have a managing board for the finances, Pastor Mark, myself, Harvey, and Stacy. I would like one more. Just We usually should have an odd number. That way you don't have a, you know, a tie on a vote or something. But you know what? I'm not worried about that because we're, we're here to follow Christ. And he's never let us down. And he's not about to. And I'm, I'm just here to share with you from my heart that we are in a good place. We are in a good place. And I'm believing that God is going to continue to provide. I made some decisions. I said, I want to start decorating a little bit. You know, I'm tired of a commercial look. I want to get some plants in here. Just like, you know, and, and, and it's open to everyone. Just want to start. That's why you see the banners. I want to just start, you know, let's let's make it our church. Exactly. Let's make it who we are because of who Christ has made us to be. And I believe there should be a level of excellence mm -hmm. in it. Because we got a <laughs> community that we can reach. Right here. You know, just to give you a quick example, our attorney, I didn't realize he was going through what he was going through physically, and I wrote a letter to him, basically told him that, you know, you can count on this church praying for you. We're praying for his healing. What a wonderful, wonderful representation of the love of Christ. We're not doing it for any other alternative but to see God move on, the, on behalf of someone else. And what a testimony that could be. And you know what? I don't care if he's Catholic. I don't care if he's Baptist. It don't matter. Did you hear me? It doesn't matter. No prayer. We will stand for the truth of God's word. Amen. Mm -hmm. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you, Father, that you are, oh, so wonderful in our lives. We can count on you, Jesus, every moment of every day. Right now, I pray, Father, your blessings over every individual in this church. I thank you, Father, for the offerings. I thank you, Father, that you've blessed them going in, coming out, because their eyes and life and thoughts are focused on you. They are radically changed because of your goodness. We love you. We adore you. And we thank you for this opportunity to spend with you. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys have a blessed week. Amen? Amen. We're moving. We're going places. Amen? Amen. And thank Harvey for the wonderful spread of the fruit. Yes, thank you, Harvey. That was great. Yeah, thank you. All right. Thank you all. Thank you. All right.